you need to do things there. Or can you hold this one? Anna Maria, will you do the countdown when, you, when we are live? Me? Yeah. Okay. No, not Maria. Do oh, no, 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 I don't think so. Yeah, not Maria. <laughs> Either way, okay. <laughs> Last second producer. <laughs> no. Rare, rare name, yeah. Yeah. No, Anna Maria. Anna Maria, can you hear me? Will you do the countdown? Okay. Sorry for that, Maria. So, can you hear me uh, now? Or we can hear you now. I'm trying to, 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 to get the sound a little bit louder. Uh, so uh, okay. Uh, earphones uh, need it. Okay. Yeah, we hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> you have to give me a sign. Welcome to the Museum of Movements and Freedom Talk number three, this time in collaboration with London-based Index on Censorship. My name is Ana Maria, and I'm very happy to introduce her moderator, Sandra Tuveson. Sandra is a very experienced moderator specializing in culture, politics, media, and artistic freedom. I will leave the word now to Sandra to introduce her amazing panel for this important discussion. Welcome. Thank you very much, Malmö, and hello from Stockholm. Uh, we have a panel uh, here with us uh, from uh, different parts of the world. I will introduce them, each, each one. Uh, first, we have Maria or John Kidse from, uh, from the, um, you're working- uh, Justice uh, for Journalists Foundation. Justice for Journalists, and you're based in London, but you're yes. uh, from Russia in the beginning. Uh, and welcome as well, Mark Frary. Uh, you are from Index, uh, an associate editor there. Warm, warm welcome to you as well. Thanks, Sandra. It's uh, good to be here. Um, but like many people, um, <clears throat> I'm actually out in the countryside at the moment uh, because we're not going into the office. Okay, okay, great. And as well, we have from Nishti Novgorod, uh, we have Alexander Pishguin. Uh, is that correct? Hello. Hello. Uh, Pichugin. Pichugin. Uh -huh. A very warm welcome to you as well. Uh, we're so happy to have you here. Uh, Hello, everybody. Thank you. And um, thank you for this opportunity. Just to say as well, you are the journalist who will give us some witnesses from, from, the, from the ground here today. Uh, Maria and Mark has been working together on a, on a project, the, the censorship project, disease control, that they will give us uh, more information about soon. As we all know, uh, we are affected uh, very much um, during this pandemic time. Since mid-February, uh, Mark and Maria's organization, Justice for uh, Journalists and uh, Index uh, on Censorship, have been working on because they're so experienced um, monitoring these kinds of situations. They knew early on that something was going, uh, going in the wrong way. So they made contact. Uh, I have asked the three of you to give some three, four minutes keynote, uh, like, a, like a point of view from your position. What has been happening? Why did we have to start monitoring the threats to journalists that we uh, already before knew was so bad, what was going to happen even more uh, in a pandemic situation. Maria, could you please start with giving your uh, history? Thank you very much, Sandra, and uh, thank you very much for 
inviting uh, Justice for Journalists, for Journalists Foundation to uh, be on this panel. So we are a rather new organization. We're just two years old. And we were found after the group of uh, Russian investigative journalists was ambushed and murdered in the Central African Republic. And no official investigation followed. Uh, as a result, the foundation uh, deemed its purpose to issue grants for investigation of uh, violent crimes against journalists. Uh, as well, we are providing educational resources and courses for journalists to uh, help with their security. And we also, the third kind of big area of our work is monitoring of attacks and violations against media workers in the former Soviet Union. Uh, so uh, when uh, Index of Censorship uh, approached us in mid-March with the idea of monitoring the situation that was unveiling around the COVID-19 and uh, following violations against journalists and the freedom of speech, uh, we thought that it's a brilliant idea because we were already monitoring the situation of violations and uh, we are uniquely positioned with a very large network in these 12 uh, former Soviet Union countries uh, from which we receive uh, daily updates and alerts on various types of uh, attacks on journalists. Okay. So uh, we... Uh, which excuse these me? 12 countries are? Could you tell uh, us? The, yeah, 12, 12 former Soviet republics. Uh, so these are um, uh, everything uh, apart from Baltic uh, states that are now part of the European Union. So the biggest being, of course, Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Central Asia, uh, Armenia, Georgia. Belarus. So these countries, sorry? Belarus? Uh, Belarus, of course. Yes, yes, 12, 12 countries. So, uh, yes, so we, we were monitoring them already, and uh, uh, it, um, uh, we uh, contacted our network and they happily agreed to monitor uh, all the violations that were taking place in their countries, as they, it was already quite noticeable. And uh, of course, uh, we will uh, probably speak about the details uh, later on in this roundtable, but uh, the main uh, conclusion that we uh, came up with is that uh, in this unprecedented situation with the pandemic, uh, the autocratic regimes of, of the Central Asia, of Belarus and Russia, uh, used the pandemics to suppress the free, free speech. Mm -hmm. So the goal was not to uh, eliminate uh, the fakes, as it was claimed, not to eliminate the uh, false statistic, as it was claimed. The goal was to suppress the free speech, to uh, in, ensure that there is no other uh, information coming out uh, about the situation rather than uh, from the official sources. And the official sources were not interested in producing uh, correct information. They were just interested in silencing the truth, unfortunately. Um, so the main two um, violations that the journalists uh, received were spreading uh, fakes and disinformation. And the second one was just breaking this freshly introduced rules of self-isolation, quarantine, emergency, ah, et cetera. Yes. This, this was the, the main finding. And I will uh, let Mark speak about the whole, uh, the wider world, because this obviously, uh, the, the index of censorship was uh, initially, they intended to monitor just Europe, but as, as they started doing this job, they, they have received alerts from all over the world. So it became a global project. Okay, thank you, Maria. Mark, let's uh, move towards you. Uh, Index organization has been around for a much longer time. Could you give us uh, the context of your organization? Yeah, sure. So um, Index on Censorship um, in 2022 will uh, celebrate its 50th anniversary. So uh, we were we were set up really to give a voice to, to censored artists and, and activists and you know we have a very long heritage with the the Soviet Union we were one of the publications that published uh, the works of Alexander Solzhenitsyn for example from from cap captivity there so that's something that we've been doing for for those five decades um, media freedom has been something that we've uh, looked at very carefully over that time in addition to artistic freedom and um, what we uh, know is that whenever there's a crisis like the COVID crisis although you know many say that's an unprecedented one um, authoritarian leaders use that as cover to to clamp down both on activists 
and on journalists. And um, unfortunately, that's proven to be the case. I think, you know, we didn't we didn't have a, a crystal ball when we started this project. We started discussing it in February. And the, the reason we were doing it then is because we could already tell that China was not revealing everything that was going on in Wuhan, as as was widely covered at the time, and you know there are those who argue that if um, if they had have been more open and they'd allowed journalists and and doctors to speak rather than um, silencing them, then the world wouldn't be in the position that it is today, um, with most of it in in lockdown and economies in free fall, uh, journalists and bloggers um, having been um, attacked. Uh, detained and in some cases disappeared as as has happened in in China and so as I say you know we've seen this in the past we've uh, worked on media freedom projects in the past where we see uh, authoritarian leaders using these opportunities to to clamp down and um, and so um, it was it was very good uh, to start a collaboration with uh, Maria and uh, JFJ on this I mean we had originally thought of targeting just Europe. Um, we weren't sure exactly what we would see um, in in Europe, but uh, it became clear very quickly that um, you know there were going to be media freedom restrictions there as well as all around the world. And yes, the former Soviet Union has probably um, had the most uh, attacks that we've recorded through this project, but uh, they have occurred um, all through the world. So um, I just thought it'd be uh, useful just to talk a little bit about how we actually did this project. So um, my background is really as a, as a, you know, I'm, I'm actually a scientist by, uh, by training. I'm a nuclear physicist uh, back in, uh, you know, the 1990s, but um, I then moved into to journalism and technical journalism, particularly. So I, I have a sort of a fairly strong grounding in, in technology. And um, one of the things that I've been doing is sort of data journalism, um, over the years, and I've worked for newspapers like The Times and The Sunday Times here in the UK, as well as um, as with uh, Index on Censorship. So it seemed logical to me that we should do a um, an interactive project looking at this, and obviously with uh, the nature of it being global, that we should do a, a global map uh, uh, illustrating some of these incidents. So the way it worked is we set up a, a form where people could report uh, their incidents. Um, we obviously have our own team in the UK of staff, but uh, also an extended network of correspondents, just as Maria and JFJ do, uh, that we use on a daily basis, not just on this project, but um, to inform us of what's going on in the world. So, you know, at the moment we're hearing from people, you know, not as part of this project, but we're hearing from people in Belarus and the Philippines and, you know, all over the world, Lot, lots going on right at this moment, um, you know, beyond what's being restricted uh, during COVID. So um, it's important to note that the the report that we've, that we've come out with now, it, it doesn't represent every attack that's occurred on on journalists and bloggers over that time but um we, we make we think it's important to verify these incidents so um whenever we're informed of one by you know one of our t team or network or, or a reader of the magazine then we have to investigate that to make sure that it's um, actually a legitimate report of attack because there's lots of disinformation as we as we know a lot and um and so that involves you know looking for independent media sources and and witnesses and statements and, and speaking to the individuals uh like alexander who's on the, on this call with us uh, now and um the way we've dealt with those incidents is we've categorized them in lots of different ways so um we've categorized them as you know attacks on journalists so whether that's a physical attack um, you know, a verbal attack or, or a mental attack. We've also looked to things like changes in, in legislation that make it more difficult for the media to report. So one example of this that we've noted a lot of is uh, restrictions on freedom of information, for example. So, you know, many countries around the world have freedom of information legislation allowing journalists to ask the government what's been going on and what, what the official response is. And, you know, a lot of what's been happening is that that's been very restricted during COVID, partly some say because it's, um, you know, physically more difficult uh, for those people, the politicians and the uh, the authorities to provide this information, but some are using it as a cover to not provide this information because they don't want the official line to come out. And I, I think... Well. Um, and then... Um, <clears throat> And the other thing we've noted a lot of as well is, um, and Maria alluded to this in, in her introduction as well, is the, um, the restriction of reporting to official state 
journalists as well. And I'm sure Alexander will talk about this as well. So in many countries, you know, even in, in the UK, which, um, you know, relative, relatively is free in terms of its media, um, we've seen restrictions on, on the questions that people are allowed to ask and who's allowed to ask those questions. So um, in terms of, you know, actual um, incidents, uh, the most common has been uh, detention and arrest. So people... Um, being detained by the police and arrested on often on trumped up charges uh, relating to you know the states of emergency that often have been introduced around the world uh, but we've also seen more than 50 physical attacks on, on journalists as well um, I think Donald Trump did, uh, needs a special mention here I mean he hasn't been physically attacking journalists but um, his verbal attacks have uh, increased during COVID, as many reporters have uh, challenged him on his um, handling of the COVID crisis. And um, the, the last thing I probably want to say in this introduction is really, you know, we, this report that we've released today, and you can see that on, on our website at indexoncensorship.org slash media freedom during COVID, and also on the JFJ site, um, they've produced their newsletter today. So you can see the copies of that. That, that report relates to the period up to mid-September when we um, have reported more than um, 240 inc verified incidents around the world. So, you know, what we thought of back in February and March, it's really been borne out by, by the evidence. This, this was really a huge problem that was waiting to happen. And we, we recognize that obviously there's a global health crisis going on and that um, certain individual freedoms need to be restricted, but, um, you know, it, it shouldn't extend to media and bloggers because, you know, unless we have open transparent discussion of this information around the pandemic how are we going to get through this how yeah great thank you mark i will get back to you with some questions with what sure. you presented now but um first alexander i want to say hi to you and welcome again uh you are just for um backdrop information you are the first journalist in russia to be put on trial for um, writing journalism about the COVID uh, with a new law uh, regarding to fake news. They have accused you of fake news when you reported on COVID, uh, the pandemic situation. And um, the, you're just waiting for, for uh, information about how the trial has mm. been uh, going uh, this uh, yes, yes, the decision will be, uh, I guess, in, mi in mid November. Yeah. So uh, please tell us uh, how do you work and, and what is your background and, uh, and to give us the context of your situation. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm working uh, in Nizhny Novgorod, it's a uh, quite big city uh, east from Moscow, uh, 300 miles uh, east from Moscow, over a million inhabitants. Uh, we, we got a lot of uh, uh, newspapers, uh, TV channels, and uh, uh, internet sites, but all of them actually just rewriting uh, the official information about the coronavirus. And, and it's not a problem for journalists if, if they just rewrite uh, all, all the official things. But if you want some exclusive information, you got, you got to be very careful because, because we got some, some new articles in... Uh, in the Russian criminal code, uh, uh, the authorities uh, issued uh, that articles as a part of preparation for the pandemic. And uh, they say that it, it's, it, it's, uh, it needs to prevent panic uh, among people. And uh, right now I got one of these articles on me. Uh, uh, they accuse me in spreading fake news. Um, although it wasn't news, it was just my personal opinion about the, the whole situation on, at the start uh, start period of, uh, of pandemic. Mm. You know, I saw, I saw a lot of people gathering in Russian churches uh, on April 12. That was uh, some kind of traditional uh, Orthodox rituals uh, a week before Russian Orthodox Easter. And we got uh, all the cafes, all the restaurants, all the parks uh, closed. Uh, at that time, and only uh, the churches uh, opened their doors uh, uh, and uh, welcomed people and welcomed people. 
uh, I was v actually very angry because it's it, it was uh, completely against all the rules and all the barriers that uh, local officials tried to set to to, to prevent uh, the spreading of uh, the coronavirus. So I was uh, disappointed uh, a lot, and uh, I just can't uh, can't be silent. Uh, I couldn't uh, couldn't be silent and. Uh, uh, I wrote about this situation in all my official uh, resources, and uh, after that, I just uh, tried to to express my emotions uh, to describe the situation in 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 more emotional uh, way on my uh, anonymous Telegram channel. That was a, a small quote, a sm a small small article, but but it was maybe maybe a little bit rough but uh, I, I just can't uh, hold it inside because I, I compared I compared all these uh, all these uh, churches all these rituals and uh, and crowded churches to the planned action of infecting people and actually that was true because uh, I, I think it's it's an axiom because uh, every scientist uh, will tell you that if you got a lot of people in some narrow space you you got high risk of uh, spreading the infection uh, far beyond that uh, that place and and i must admit that uh, i was uh, i was uh, i was right because two weeks after uh, this uh, situation uh, after my my article was wrote we got we got uh, some uh, some big source of infection in the largest, the largest uh, local Orthodox monastery. It was the town of Divievo, and the whole town was set on quarantine. And I, I, I know, I think that uh, that was the direct result of violation of the epi epidemiological rules on April 12th, the day I, I wrote my, uh, my article. Um, it was emotional. It was uh, maybe a rough a, a little bit, um, but uh, I, I must mention that I deleted my my uh, my article the day after uh, writing because uh, I got a call from FSB, uh, uh, former KGB uh, organization, and they they told me to delete it. And uh, in a few minutes, uh, they uh, uh, they called me back again and, and and said, "Hold on, don't don't delete. Uh, let it be. Let, let it exist for a while." So I actually I, I realized that they had some some kind of plan about me, and uh, I deleted my text, but it didn't help. And uh, just in two days, uh, two days later, there was a knock on my door. It was uh, it was uh, nine. It was a squad of nine people, an investigator, FSB officers, people in camouflage who who hand, handcuffed me and uh, scared my pregnant wife and took my phone and my lap, laptop. And uh, two months later, my case uh, was sent uh, to court. Despite an explanation given by the Supreme Court of Russia uh, back, back on April 30, uh, the Supreme Court uh, has explained uh, what kind of news the police can call fake news and uh, they they told that it should look a lot like real news it must include all the quotes names documents uh, uh, possibly fake videos and all that all that stuff and none of them was in my article my article was emotional point of view um, uh, but it did not stop the investigators and now i'm i'm in in, in waiting of uh, the core decision, uh, I, I, um, I guess I will be fined uh, for for quite a big sum of money, be, um, uh, and I must uh, uh, admit that my colleague and my friend Irina Slavina, who tragically died uh, on October twelfth, uh, on October second, uh, here in Nizhny Novgorod, also was uh, fined uh, 
and they accuse accused her in spreading the fake uh, fake news about the coronavirus, but it was a so-called uh, administrative article uh, of Russian administrative court. And I'm actually, yes, I'm actually the first uh, journalist uh, with, uh, with a criminal code on me. I don't know uh, what, what decision to expect, uh, but, uh, but the uh, uh, independent experts uh, said that my, uh, that my article wasn't news, it was, it was uh, personal opinion. It's very hard to expect uh, how, how judge will uh, plead, me, uh, plead me guilty, but I guess uh, I, I need to save uh, a lot of money right now to, 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 be, to be ready. It's, uh, it's a ridiculous situation. I need to, as we said in Russia, I need to prove that I'm not a camel. Uh, uh, it's uh, the, whole, the whole situation uh, here in Russia for journalism is, uh, is getting darker and darker uh, every month, every day. Uh, fines, uh, police searches and uh, all the, all the state of all the state of pressure in general it's uh, it's a huge part of uh, our journalists life mm. i'm 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 not an optimistic uh, actually uh, about the future nearest future uh, if if i will uh, if i will plead no not guilty i will be very very uh, Uh, excuse me, uh, 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 I'm, a, I'm a little bit emotional right now because it's it's the longest English longest English speech in my life, and uh, uh, thank you for for this opportunity to to tell you about this situation. Your uh, English is very good. It's not good to to have an, a, a criminal article, a criminal case on, on you. Uh, it, it's not what uh, what I expected. Uh, 20 years ago when I decided to, to be a journalist. <laughs> Have you been able to work uh, with uh, other journalists during this period since you were accused of this? Yes, oh. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work, uh, but I, 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 need, uh, I need to, to hold some information uh, because, um, because uh, I don't want to be a repeat offender uh, in, the, in the authorities. Uh, Eyes, uh, I, I got some uh, exclusive information about the real situation of, of the uh, pandemic here in Nizhny Novgorod region. Mm -hmm. But now I'm I'm trying to to uh, to hold it inside because uh, because it's uh, it's quite dangerous right now. Because you're waiting for the verdict. Yes, yes, uh, I'm waiting for for decision. But... Do you get support from other media platforms in uh, in Russia, like Novaya Gazeta and others? Yeah, um, a lot, a lots of uh, media resources, uh, platforms uh, wrote about my story, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, actually, I, I don't, I, I don't uh, need to be very famous about in, in that in that case. Uh, yeah. I. I, I just want to continue my work and continue my job and do do it do it uh, as as usual. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, Maria, can I ask you uh, regarding um, you're covering your organization is covering twelve countries? Uh, I, I asked you before when we when we talked. Um, maybe this is the, the thing that uh, sticks out, uh, or have you seen other things that really stick out during this pandemic situation uh, regarding the 12 countries that you cover mainly? Ah, sound. 
Alexander. Uh, yes, as, as Alexander uh, was just uh, explaining, uh, the criminalization of, of fake news uh, just was swiftly introduced by uh, the Russian authorities. And as people were getting uh, accusation under the administrative code uh, before, uh, once this uh, new uh, criminal code article number 2000, uh, to, you know, 207, I think, yeah. 207, yeah. The criminal code article. Point one. Yeah, point one, yes. Uh, that, that is specifically about writing fake news um, uh, on coronavirus. Uh, since it was introduced, uh, Alexander was the first one to be accused under it, and then 15 more cases uh, followed. Uh, whereas on administrative charges, about 50 journalists were accused. Um, so that's the that's if we talk about Russia. But if we look elsewhere, for example, countries like Belarus and Tajikistan, and of course Turkmenistan, initially for the first several months of, of the virus, they just said, you know, there is no virus in our country. They they completely refuse to acknowledge that there is, uh, you know, such thing as pandemics, uh, global pandemics. That, of course, doesn't in exclude any country. The borders, you know, are not uh, stopping it. And uh, of course, that resulted. Uh, and all the journalists who tried to write about the real situation. And here we're talking, of course, about Belarus mainly, because in Turkmenistan there is no independent uh, journalism. There is absolutely uh, dictator country so there's nobody writes about things that happen that are happening there from inside there are some independent media from outside mm -hmm. uh, so in these countries uh, the situation uh, got really uh, awful because people didn't know uh, what what is going on and they didn't take any precautions so uh, what happened is that fake information distributed by these particular countries killed a lot of people because people didn't know uh, that they have to take measures to, to protect themselves um, so uh, yes and uh, in terms of uh, uh, violent uh, crimes against journalists that was not uh, that active uh, mainly um, in in the countries that we were looking in these 12 countries uh, the main problem with um, violent crimes against journalists, uh, I mean beatings, uh, that was um, surprisingly Ukraine. Uh, and uh, in this country, uh, the, uh, small, the owners of small businesses uh, were the ones who, were, who would beat up journalists for, uh, independent journalists mainly, again, who were covering the situation with the lack of precautionary measures, the lack of masks, uh, the not following epidemiological rules, and this, this were uh, subjected to uh, violent beatings. In Russia, there were also some violent crimes uh, against journalists. Uh, we registered three cases, and astonishingly, all three cases of beating up journalists uh, happened in Russian Orthodox churches, uh, where uh, the, uh, either the priests themselves or the church goers would beat up the journalists uh, exactly for uh, uncovering the real situation with lack of uh, measures. So, um, but in majority of cases, uh, the um, perpetrators uh, of um, attacks against journalists, and here we're talking about the uh, legal or quasi-legal attacks, were the, um, the governmental bodies, the police, uh, the parliaments, uh, the uh, various embassies and departments, uh, that, that, that they, they were the ones who would be the perpetrators of, of attacks in Russia. There was three quarters of attacks uh, came from the authorities. In Belarus, 90% uh, of attack were coming from authorities. In Kazakhstan, 55% of attacks and that, that sort of thing. So um, uh, what is obvious uh, here is the impact uh, on the health and safety of the populations of these countries, of course, because uh, fakes that were distributed by the official channels kill. And um, in, in Russia, again, uh, the main fakes that were distributed through official channels are those that are, um, were, were spread by, by the Russian federal TV channels, like uh, the virus doesn't exist, or the virus was created by Bill Gates, or, you know, that sort of things. Um, so, yeah, and just um, uh, as a result. Yeah, sorry. This control really covers two levels. It's both the, the attack on journalists and then the 
the the killing of, uh, of ordinary people on the ground. Yes, as a result, as a result of lack of in, of independent of, of information, uh, you know, the Russian population, for example, the official prognosis this year is that the Russian population is going to shrink by three. Uh, 350,000 people. So roughly the population of Malmö, Swedish uh, third city, right? Uh, it's, uh, and it's 11 times more than in 2019. And this is official figure. So we can understand that probably unofficial, it's even, it's going to be even more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the result of, uh, of, of, of uh, suppressing the independent reporting and truth. Thank you, Maria. Mark, I wanted to move further to you. We talked about uh, journalists becoming scapegoats in this situation, and we really see it in the in the um, United States with the Trump uh, in his uh, rhetorics and so on, blaming journalists uh, uh, with the message. Uh, could you give us, um, could you lay out the words about this situation? Yeah, sure, uh, Sandra. So um, I just sort of want to, you know, go back a little bit on what Maria had said. I mean, we noticed that fake news thing um, happening a lot around the world, not just in um, Russia and the former Soviet Union. We saw that. Um, I think we had 30 uh, different uh, incidents related to to fake news. And, um, you know, and that brings me nicely on to Donald Trump, obviously, who's really sort of popularized that idea that, um, you know, you, you can decide if you're an authoritarian leader what makes fake news and um <clears throat> you know by by the very fact you know ever since he came to power he's been denouncing what uh, his critics have been saying about him as as fake news it it really um <clears throat> it's enabled an environment uh in which attacks on on the media have become acceptable i think um you know particularly in the u.s obviously and we've we've seen this um, with one of our other partners actually with the u.s um freedom tracker um, who've been tracking attacks on journalists uh, this well for the last few years but uh, specifically this year in the wake of the Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. protest so um, you know they, they recorded hundreds of attacks on journalists um, during that during those protests and um, you know many of them were from from security forces the police um, but also worryingly many of them are from um, members of the public as well and I think you know this is something that we've certainly noticed um, over the period of, of COVID is that the media has been allowed to become a target of, of people's anger um, against the restrictions that are being placed on them so you know obviously you know, we're, we're all um, you know, annoyed by having our restriction the freedom of uh, these restrictions on us um, you know not being able to see our families and uh, things like this and so Clearly, that's, um, you know, people don't like that, um, but I have certainly noticed, and maybe this is, you know, anecdotal for me as well, but I've certainly noticed as a journalist that people, you know, treat journalists in a different way now, and I certainly... Um, you know, from the start of of COVID, I've started noticing people being more critical of, of journalists um, on social media and about what they're reporting. I mean, certainly here in, in the UK, we had uh, um, very early on in this, we had this um, meme going around on social media saying that, um, you know, journalists haven't got the mood of the country. They don't know, you know, what they're reporting. They shouldn't be reporting these negative things about COVID and, um, you know, that they should be uh, producing positive news and helping with um, uh, targeting the, the COVID virus. But, you know, the, the reality is that journalists, you know, have a job to do. They're, they're independent, you know, as Alexander is here, you know, it's about, you know, telling the, the truth. I mean, I know that we can't be solely responsible for telling the truth but um you know we have a really important role in in democracies uh, for the press and, and and that's about keeping an eye on the people who are in positions of power and and revealing things when when they're not doing what they should be doing and uh, and we need as journalists i think we need to look at that uh, you know how we present ourselves a lot more you know so so you know donald trump has you know made it made it acceptable to attack journalists and attack their work and which has translated into physical attacks at these black lives matter protests 
but um, we need to do a better job at saying actually, you know, what we do is really important as journalists. You know, you know we're not we're not trying we're not saying um, you know we're not we're not trying to be negative all the time. But that's naturally the way it comes o- over sometimes. I think you know that we're you know reporting these negative things, and of course we're in the middle of a global health pandemic, so there are lots of negative stories around. And yes, we do try to cover positive news stories as journalists anyway, not necessarily, you know, in, in my role at Index, but, um, you know, journalists in the wider sense, you know, they are reporting these positive stories, but there are a lot of negative stories around. And But we need to actually say to to people out there, saying, look, look, we're just doing our jobs. We, um, I know it's it's a very negative story that we're, we're relating here, but we're just trying to tell you the reality on the ground, you know, whether that's, you know, the number of people who've died from, from COVID or that there's, been corruption you know which we've seen you know all over the world you know in the in the awarding of huge contracts like here in the UK to uh, people who have close connections with the the ruling conservative party for example you know multi-billion pound contracts that are being awarded with very little scrutiny and we've noticed um, you know a huge amount of that that going on and uh, you know at, at that large scale but also the small scale and that's just in the UK and we know that that's going on around the world and that there are stories that but, uh, because journalists are being attacked and are f- fearful, as Alexander has, has very clearly stated to us, you know, that he's fearful about this. You know, he knows the information, but, he, you know, he, he's fearful to tell that. But uh, without people like Alexander and other brave journalists and bloggers around the world, I mean, how are we, how are we going to hold them to account? You know, that I know that they have a very difficult job to do. I wouldn't like to be a, a political leader right now trying to deal with this, but, um, you know, the, we, we are not the enemy as journalists. Yeah. This comes um, to my brain to think about uh, the two, 240 incidents that you have, are covering in the disease control from, from uh, mid to mid to until mid-September. Uh, you told me about uh, Tanzania. I wanted to leave the US and the UK a little bit and, and look out in Europe and, and the other con- uh, continents. Uh, and we spoke upon the o- authoritarian leaders. Uh, yeah, so um, I've been... Uh, writing this week about um, Tanzania, for example, which, um, like the US, has uh, been having elections. So earlier this week, they had an election. And, um, you know, it was fairly clear early on that um, John Magafuli, who's the incumbent president there, um, you know, the opinion polls were saying that he would get reelected. You know, he had a very, very strong lead. Um, but it's interesting to see, uh, you know, why that has happened. And so, um you know, early in, early in the year, in January, he said, you know, he was committed, you know, unlike many leaders in Africa, to free and fair um, elections. Um, but, you know, the evidence since then is that actually he's not. So he's closed down independent media, you know, so his uh, political rivals have been prevented from registering for the elections. Um, but then there's also the matter of, of his... Uh, response to COVID as well. So, um, you know, it's interesting to look at those statistics. We've talked a lot here about, you know, official statistics. If you look at Tanzania's official statistics, they've stayed at something like 500 cases since um, since June. And, um, you know, the government might have you believe that that's because they've somehow miraculously um, succeeded in beating COVID, unlike um, every other country in the world, maybe apart from Turkmenistan as well. But, um, um, you know, the reality is that um, he, you know, John Magafuli um, feels that you know, COVID has been overblown and it may be, you know, f- fake news. And uh, um, and so there was a there was a case earlier on in the year where he um, he set up the uh, public health authorities to um, do some tests and uh, they carried out some tests on um, on some samples and they came back with COVID, but it turned out that they'd actually been provided from animals and uh, you know, fruit and things like this. So, um, he, you know, he, this discredited the whole testing regime in the country. And then shortly afterwards, they stopped producing official statistics. But um, uh, he, he then sort of turned this around and said, well, actually, you know, this is this is, you know, God helping us here. It's the power of prayer that saved us from from COVID. And so, you know, Tanzania has effectively returned to normal day, everyday life and people are congregating and, um, you know, the in, independent uh, journalists say that, you know, the reality is that tens of thousands of people may, may have had COVID and may still have COVID in the country, but because no one's talking about it, 
Um, John Magafuli is, is reaping the benefit of that um, you know, because people believe that he's actually helped cure it with the help from God. The religious leaders around the world are using this situation as well as the dictators. They, they make a good club together right now. Um, Alexander, uh, can I ask you, uh, what is the main thing that you see that organizations like, uh, like JFJ and Index on Censorship can do to help a person like you reporting from the ground? Actually, I didn't think about it, but mm, uh, I, I feel I feel great support right now. So I guess the, the, that's that's uh, uh, that's already quite enough <laughs> enough for me. Taking part in seminars like this, maybe as well. I, I, I did I, I did know what what, what expect uh, uh, about this uh, seminar, but. Mm. It's it's because of my uh, English level. I, I I just I just don't know. Are you understanding me at all? We <laughs> um, are. We are. <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> but it's a great it's a great thing. I mean, yes, this this seminar has uh, obviously helped me to 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 get through this situation and and try to. Uh, to forget about all these perils, uh, try to continue my job, my work. Mm -hmm. Does any of you panelists have any questions to each other? Are you thinking about anything that you want to ask the one of the others? I just want to pick up. This. Well, um, I think you know, from from my perspective, I just want to you know thank Alexander for for doing this, and you know he is one of many hundreds and maybe thousands of people around the world who are, who are doing this and you know I do consider myself lucky I'm sitting you know in in the UK where it's very safe but you know I'm speaking to people like Alexander all the time and uh, you know we we recognize and appreciate you know the, the strength and fortitude that you show and uh, that you're doing this and um, you know you know, it must be very, very difficult. I, I cannot understand the, you know, the, the challenges that you must be facing in your your day to day work. And, uh, you know, if there is anything that, that we can do to help you, then, you know, we will obviously do that. We're a small organization, but, um, you know, part of what we do is, um, you know, telling these stories to a, a wider audience so that um, people are not overlooked and forgotten and uh, you know so so many of these people who we talk about in these stories so I, I, I talked about you know one of the Chinese uh, bloggers who disappeared at the very early stages of this you know and so it's important that we you know remember who they are and remember their names and and keep asking where is this person and um, so I'm, I'm hoping that that's one thing that we can do is just so that so that people like that are not forgotten but we, we welcome any any inputs as well from people like alexander to say how we can help thank you in you, different thank, ways thank you mark for for your support and uh, and uh, yes the, the, there's a lot of things here here in russia that uh, I, I just can't explain uh, to to the people who never live here uh, but i know uh, i know that uh, i got some some strong support from from the other journalists, from uh, from lots of my colleagues, uh, they wrote the letters uh, uh, to to the Russian authorities to uh, to stop my my case, and uh, uh, it, they uh, they actually didn't react. Uh, but uh, I feel the support of uh, of, of the whole uh, whole Russian journalism, and right now I feel uh, I feel that uh, I get uh, support from from all over the world that, that, that's great Thank that's you. great to hear alexander when we talked before you you said that working from uh, novgorod uh, is it's a bit um different from working from for example moscow uh, yes moscow Mo moscow is not russia as we used to say here <laughs> because you said everyone knows each other companies uh, like um, members of families own com companies and so on it's a i can imagine it's like uh, a small country as well mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. everybody knows each other or, and our family politicians and um company leaders and so on could you could you tell us what is what is the 
the biggest uh, difficulty with working uh, in a in a smaller town with one well, million? Um, it, it it sounds it sounds strange, but I I uh, I get I get uh, quite good relationships with uh, local local officials uh, and. Uh, uh, Two days before my article, uh, I actually had a, a Zoom conference with the governor of the Nizhny Novgorod region, and uh, they and he he looked very confused about the whole situation, and uh, and and he asked uh, all the journalists and the bloggers to to to, to find some new words about uh, this uh, pandemic, this uh, this virus. Uh, uh, to make people stay home, to to try to uh, make it uh, be more 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 careful and uh, think about uh, self safety. So uh, I wrote I, I wrote some of these uh, articles and and now I got uh, uh, the 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 court uh, case on me. No, uh, it's it, it it's uh, it's different. Was, has that person said anything? Has that person backed you? No, because it's official. <sighs> that wasn't officially. Uh, he said that he 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 tried to to help me uh, in in this situation, but. Um, the uh, the investigators uh, got uh, worked very quickly about me, about me, my case uh, uh, and they I, I don't think that uh, the government uh, has any influence on this uh, on this case uh, even even if uh, he he said about it, it to me maybe he 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 just wanted me to believe in that. In, in, in this, yes. We have some minutes uh, left. I wanted to to ask you, Mark, how has it been working with the data journalism that you have been doing mapping two hundred and thirty incidents? Um, I think um, you know the the challenge is um, you know I, I referred to it earlier about um, you know verifying the stories that you know sometimes that, that is the hardest element of it the, you know the date the technology is is relatively easy you know we use you know standard um, you know Google mapping and uh, we've worked with developers to develop our map but um, the actual verification process is often the hardest thing because that's um, very reliant on traditional journalism skills like um, picking up the phone and uh, contacting people like um, Alexander and um, actually talking to them and so you know a lot of things I, I can remember talking to people in the Philippines over over Facebook and um, you know and the, the difficulty obviously with the pandemic is that you can't um, physically go to places to meet people so you know in some ways um, it's been made easier and with tools like zoom as we're on today you know enabling us to, to talk to people but um, as we know a lot of these technologies are not um, very secure either so this is why we use things like telegram and, uh, and signal um, so uh, you know it's it's really that element of it that's that's proven the, the most difficult and and you know in a lot of these countries they um the authorities don't want you to contact these people to find out these stories because they don't want that story to come out so there are cases that we've had reported that we haven't been able to put on our map just because we haven't been able to get independent verification of those which is you know it's a it's sad that we're, that's the case but um you know obviously we try to put on as many as as we can um I think um, you know the other. You know, before we end as well, it's also worth uh, mentioning that there's there's another sort of hidden um, hidden thing that's been going on as well, uh, particularly in uh, um, in countries like the UK and the US, where um, journalism is is at risk. Local journalism, particularly because of the financial situation. You know, we're, the you know economies are. Are really struggling at this time and you know the, the media industry is is really really struggling right now so you know a lot of local newspapers have uh, have been forced to stop printing their print editions uh, for example uh, so they can't um, gain the the money that people use to buy that uh, newspaper but also at the same time they've had their source of, of their other source of income 
uh, decimated that uh, advertising revenue because you know all of the businesses that would normally advertise in the newspapers um, have stopped doing that because uh, in often because they can't open. So um, we've seen you know, many many uh, newspapers close down here in the UK, and it's not just in the UK; it's it's all over the world. And often it's those sorts of publications that are you know very sort of localized, and you know, and it's not just. Uh, newspapers either it's bloggers who who rely on um, you know support from you know links and things like this you know that everybody's had their income from these things uh, r massively reduced and and they're the ones who who reveal these stories very often so the stories that you see on the national news very often come from um, you know people on the ground who are reporting for a local newspaper or on their lo hyper local blog and th they're not able to do that anymore because they can't get, um, get any income for it so so i think we've we're having a, a huge we're going to have a huge deficit here that's going to and it may not ever come back either a lot of these newspapers for example have been around for you know hundreds of years and uh, they've been forced to close by this and may never reopen again and some of those stories that they covered will never be reported on. And I, I think that's a very sad day for democracy. It really is, it really is. Um, uh, I get so many thoughts when you started to talk right now. So I, I uh, forgot what I wanted to ask Maria. You told us about when laws are getting back, like, uh, like we see in Hungary and, and Poland has been um, changing the laws during this uh, pandemic situation. We can't get uh, those uh, situations back. Is that a, a thing you see in, in your countries as well? The sound, Maria. Um, yes, I mean, introduction of all the laws that are suppressive. Uh, we, we don't believe that they are, they, they, they will be, you know, then turned back to normal because this is so convenient, you know, for the, for the authorities, they are not uh, unfortunately interested. And I'm talking of course about uh, countries like Russia and Belarus and Central Asian uh, countries and Azerbaijan, uh, countries that uh, are not democratic and uh, the, the, the governments are just using this situation as they would use any other crisis uh, to further suppress uh, the independent reporting. And what it leads to, of course, in countries like that and and we are seeing it now is that uh, the depletion of trust between the population and the authorities leads to more and more uh, you know uh, aggression and in Belarus for example uh, there is uh, a big belief that this um, lack of trust to the government uh, was basically the last drop that led to the uh, current uh, revolution that is going on uh, when you know the government was telling one thing that was completely uh, different from the real state of things and the population just had enough and decided to take it onto the streets and is still there until you know the, the uh, illegitimate president leaves and same situation in Kyrgyzstan where uh, people took it to the streets again uh, there is a belief that uh, the uh, suppression of, of information about the real state of affairs in terms of uh, the pandemics in this country contributed to this situation so yeah that's that's what it leads to we have a big struggle with the freedom of information and the freedom of speech and people uh, using their, their voices out in the streets aren't possible right now in, in the normal way around the world. Uh, we saw that in the BLM situation as well, a big uh, contrast situation. Um, yeah, so uh, Alexander, uh, when, when, uh, when I was talking to you, I, I couldn't stop by thinking about the other uh, main big situation that happened in, uh, in Ukraine, the Chernobyl situation, in the media cover of that situation. Uh, do you feel? Uh, uh, have you have you the same sentences in your in your stomach about this situation? Oh. Actually, no. I I I I, I don't think that. The situation here in Nizhny Novgorod and here in Russia, come on, uh, is more ri ridiculous. It, it's 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 about uh, it's about uh, 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 proven uh, that you, as as I as I already said, uh, I, I need to prove that y you're uh, a normal uh, normal human being. Uh, 
yeah it's 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 uh, it's kind of anti utopic as i uh, as i uh, as i think about it right now um, we, we we just try we just try to, to to survive here uh, in, in in local journalism uh, we don't think about uh, the the global situation and uh, don't uh, actually uh, compare us to some some mm. uh, some other cases um, yeah, I understand what you mean. It's hard to explain. Uh, I know that. Uh, mm. No, no. You just want to go on working as a professional journalist in in your in your city. It's the main target. Yes, I, I need to. I I need to go on. I need to continue. Mm -hmm. uh, we 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 hope that, of course, you will. Uh, Different thoughts about it. Uh, I, 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 yes, I, I had I had no chance. Uh, that's my job. I I, I must uh, earn some money. I, I, I listened to to what Mark said, uh, and uh, I know that uh, these these kind of problems. Uh, I know is I know it very very well because I got uh, three internet sites and we got all these ad advertising troubles and. Uh, we got all all of the troubles with the uh, with the money for 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 people who worked on us. Uh, it's it, that's the global situation. Uh, in that case, I feel that that, that um, uh, we're we're in the same boat. Thank you, all three of you, for joining you. us today, uh, Alexander. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Yes, and thanks for your time. And uh, and Alexander, we uh, wish you well in uh, your your court appearance as well um, in November. So do keep us informed on that, and we will do what we can to support you. I will tell you, of course. Alexandra, mm -hmm. definitely. Good luck. I do believe that we Goodbye. are here in the behind behind the scenes. We are here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Goodbye. Okay. Thank you, Anna Maria. I give the word to you. Thank you, Maria, Alexander, Mark, and Sandra, for this very important discussion. The Museum of Movements will continue operating for the rest of the year, and we are going to be spearheading the conversation regarding safe havens. So let's stay in touch. The next Freedom Talk will be in November with Uy Gruppen. So stay tuned. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.